When George I came to the throne as the first of the Hanoverian kings, it was the start of a new age for the British monarchy. It all came to a head in the rather ludicrous events of 1717, which were known as the Christening Quarrel. The christening was of George I's grandson, another little baby called George. George I wants his Lord Chamberlain, the Duke of Newcastle, to be the godfather for the child, but makes this decree without consulting George II. George II really doesn't want the Duke of Newcastle involved with his children in any way, and this leads to a major verbal confrontation. The Prince of Wales, the father of the baby, wasn't happy about this, and he said, you are a rascal, I will find you later to give you a piece of my mind. Unfortunately, because of the royal family's German accents, what the gate-crashing courtier heard was, you are a rascal, I will fight you. He took this as an invitation to a duel, a dreadful breach of court etiquette. There was a huge row and the king expelled the Prince of Wales out of the royal palace. What was worse than that though, was that he kept back his grandson as a hostage for future good behavior. The little baby boy fell sick and he died. It was fantastically dysfunctional. George II created the most glittering court yet. George II and his wife Caroline make a big concerted effort to create a more interesting and more public, more exciting court experience. And they really change the face of uh, British court life. Uh, they are much more interested in dance, in music, in having lavish parties, and are very successful in uh, breathing life back into the British court. This is all despite the fact that George II is notoriously dull. He loves talking about facts and figures. He constantly has the same conversation with the same person uh, without realizing what he's doing. If you'd have visited Kensington Palace in its heyday, the 1730s, the date we've chosen for our recreation, you'd have experienced quite an interesting love triangle. There was the king and the queen, and then there was his official mistress. Her name was Henrietta Howard. And in quite an interesting twist, Henrietta Howard was also the woman of the bedchamber or a close personal servant to Queen Caroline. So Henrietta was a woman of the bedchamber to both of them in different senses. The courtiers didn't find it at all scandalous that the king had a mistress. And in fact, they were pleased that he'd chosen an English one because they thought it would improve his English language skills. George was not particularly fond of his mistress, Henrietta, and only had her out of a feeling of duty. He really loved his wife, Caroline. George III was the first Hanoverian king who could claim to be truly British. I was born and educated in this country, he said. I glory in the name of Britain. He also brought a new custom to court, living happily with his wife and their 15 children. George III has what we might call an idyllic childhood. He has these very rigorous lessons in Kew Palace and he's given this extraordinary education. He's taught the sciences, the arts and architecture and all of his tutors were the leading proponents of the day. Indeed, he actually is so enthusiastic that he brings all this knowledge and education that he has into his reign. So, for example, not only does he participate in the Royal Society, he forms the Royal Institute, which is designed to bring science together with manufacture. People think of George III as the mad king who lost America. But before the madness and the melancholy, the earlier part of his life was blissfully happy.